Good morning. My name is Christina Ryan. I'm one of the vascular surgeons here. I'd like to take the time to thank Dr. Ryan for inviting me to speak. Um, and then also thank all of you for taking time out of your Tuesday morning to have breakfast with us. So I will be speaking about uh, the Ohio State University Aortic Center becoming a flagship. Ohio is the 11th move in my life. I was born in Colorado, but for the most part, I grew up in the beautiful state of Montana with Glacier National Park that you can see there. I did my undergraduate training at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu on scholarship, and then moved to San Diego for a few years where I worked as a biochemist before being accepted to medical school at the University of Miami in Miami, Florida. And at this point in my life, I decided I was done with beach towns, so I moved to Iowa. <laughs> I did my general surgery residency at the University of Iowa in Iowa City, and then completed my training at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, as Dr. Muller said, I did take a, a position at Yale University for about four years before I was recruited here to the great state of Iowa, and I'm happy to say that my husband and I are here to stay. So I was uh, asked to come here this morning to speak to you about why I chose to come to Ohio State, and it's really the aortic center. We are posed to become the flagship for the entire state of Ohio um, in aortic disease with highly trained vascular and cardiac surgeons. We are the, uh, frequently the last option for many patients with complex aneurysms, and because we work together in a team in a multidisciplinary fashion, we can provide excellent care for any patient who has need. I want to tell you a story this morning about a patient of mine that I met early on in my arrival here to Ohio. Meet Mr. John Smith. He's a 58-year-old steel worker. He's divorced with one daughter and has been employed by the steel industry his entire life. He's enjoyed cigarettes since his teenage years and for the most part he thinks he's a healthy guy. Sees his doctor occasionally for his high blood pressure and takes a single pill in the morning when he can remember. But he spends most of his days welding very heavy steel bolts and plates together, so it's not, not unusual for him to have the occasional low back pain. Generally takes an ibuprofen, goes easy for a few days, and the pain goes away. But one week in early March of this year, he had this back pain after a long, day, long hard day of work. Took a few ibuprofen, but the pain just didn't go away, and in fact progressed. And it got so bad that finally, after five days, he decides to seek care at a local emergency room on late Saturday evening. So the astute emergency physician interviews Mr. Smith and does a physical exam and considers the following diagnoses because you know common things are common and decides to get a CAT scan to try and determine what's causing Mr. Smith's back pain. But unfortunately for Mr. Smith, he doesn't have a broken rib or a kidney stone. He has a very large acutely symptomatic aortic aneurysm. So I've included Mr. Smith's CAT scan on the left and a normal CAT scan on the right. And as you can see, the aorta, or the very large circle in the center, is about four times larger than it should be. And in fact, it's so big, it's pushing on his spine. And this is what's causing his back pain. So some of you would ask, well, what is an abdominal aortic aneurysm? Well, the aorta is the largest artery in the body. It starts in the heart, ends in the pelvis. And an aneurysm can form anywhere along its course, but most commonly in, in the ab abdomen. Technically, it's a dilation of all three layers, but the best way to describe it is if you think of the aorta as a water pipe, as the walls of the water pipe weaken, the pipe gets bigger and bigger and it starts to grow. And as it grows, it can form an aneurysm, and it can grow so big that it can rupture. Now, rupture of uh, aortic aneurysms account for about 15,000 deaths per year in this country. And the, the problem with this is that it's a silent killer, which means that it remains asymptomatic until it ruptures. So how do we fix these aneurysms? Well, the easiest way, and by far the most common, is an EVAR, or a stent graft. Now, this is the minimally invasive procedure that we do. So we take a very small needle that you can see here, and we access the femoral artery in the groin, and then we use wires and catheters to go on the inside of the aorta. And as you can see from this picture here, we basically access the groin, and then we reline the pipe with a new pipe on the inside. And so you can see here the aneurysm is the bulge, the red bulge there in the aorta, and it's important to note that it's pretty far away from the kidney arteries, and that's important to note. So this is called an EVAR. It takes us about a few hours to do. I'll pass this around later if you want to see it, but this is what it looks like on the inside of the aorta. Um, and most patients go home the next day with incisions so small that, that Band-Aids will suffice. So let's get back to Mr. Smith. So unfortunately for Mr. Smith, his aneurysm is very close to the kidney arteries. He has a juxtarenal AAA. So this makes him not a candidate for a stent graft. But here at, at the Ohio State Aortic Center, we don't shy away from this kind of complex aneurysm. 
So I took the call on the emergency aorta line and arranged for med flight to fly Mr. Smith from a very small town in Ohio here to Columbus, lands on the helipad on Wexner Medical Center and Ross Hart Hospital was right there next door. We uh, took that time to alert our aortic rupture team and the cardiac anesthesiologist made ready as did our nurses. I met Mr. Smith very briefly after he landed and he was already tearful. He knew that his diagnosis could prove fatal and agreed to emergency surgery. So we had him in the operating room in the Ross Hart Hospital within minutes of him landing. I'm going to show you a few intraoperative pictures and I want to warn you because they could be graphic but I will walk you through them. So I performed an open repair of his juxtarenal aortic aneurysm. So here's his aneurysm, big large bulging thing here and you can see it goes right up to the kidney arteries which is sort of marked by this blue, blue loop there. And you see this black discoloration. So the black discoloration tells us he actually had a contained rupture. So his aneurysm had grown so much that it had broken through two out of the three layers of his, of his aorta and was within millimeters of just bursting. So I performed a tube graft repair right here. Uh, this is good for the rest of his life, hopefully another 30 years, all the while maintaining blood flow to his kidney arteries. And Mr. Smith did great. Went home five days later and has since returned to work. Now this is a very invasive emergency surgery made only possible by the dedicated team here at Ohio State. Um, and he did and had a great outcome. But I want you to think for a minute that Mr. Smith, instead of being 58, the numbers are reversed and he's 85 or he's 75, but the decades of smoking have now taken a toll on his lungs and he's on home oxygen. Now these two individuals are unlikely to be a candidate for such an invasive procedure. So what options would they have had? So as I mentioned, the aneurysm is very close to the kidney artery, so we can't use the regular E-bar, but there are other minimally invasive techniques that we can offer. So this first one is a fenestrated graft, and I have it up here in case you want to see it. Um, so this is the same, same graph. This is zoomed out, zoomed up, and then this is a cartoon picture which basically shows that the aneurysm comes right up to the kidney arteries. And this is a custom made graph. So holes are cut into the graft and made custom to the patient's anatomy. It's a wonderful graph, but it is manufactured in Australia and takes us six to eight weeks to get here. So not really an option for Mr. Smith in an emergency situation. So we can do a chimney or a snorkel graft. So what this is, is we take whatever we have available during an emergency. We take whatever we have off the shelf, stents, stent grafts, E-bars, T-bars, and we basically rearrange them, Tetris style, if you will, to seal off the aneurysm while maintaining blood flow to the kidney arteries. Now these are great procedures, it's a life-saving procedure, but the more components that we put in there, the more likelihood for complications down the line because the components can move and, and leak. And so what I'm working on here is a physician-modified endograft. So in this, we take the patient's CAT scan and we load it into our 3D software, it takes a few minutes. We do very intricate measurements, distance and arc, and we actually cut holes on the back table of a stent graft that we just take off the shelf. And we cut holes to match the patient's anatomy. After we've cut those holes, we hand sew these little gold loops around them, and this allows us to see those holes on the x-ray in our hybrid operating room so that we can put our graft in and maintain blood flow to that kidney artery. So we're essentially making a custom fenestrated graft emergently on the back table. And so this allows us to treat patients who might not be a candidate for an EVAR because of anatomy or because of their comorbidities. Now, very few institutions offer this to their patients, and this requires an IDE, or Investigational Device Exemption. I'm currently applying to the FDA for approval to be start uh, offering this to our patients. It's an arduous, complex process, requires a solid clinical team. Multiple aortic surgeons are going to be involved. We need dedicated research nurses. We need an inventory specialist. We need to upgrade our intraoperative fusion image, imaging, and we also need a radiology technician that is savvy in using that. Now the IDE is really only one facet of new technology. So here at Ohio State, we treat aortic aneurysms which are so extensive that it involves both the thoracic aorta and the chest. So this is the chest up here and extends also down in the abdomen. The thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm is really the reason that I was put on this planet. Um, this is an intense, maximally invasive, yet highly intricate procedure where I replace the entire aorta and all of its branches. I spent a large majority of my time and training at Hopkins honing my skills doing this procedure. Every patient is different, requires creativity, requires on my feet thinking for often what's times is a 10 to 12 hour procedure. And I'm happy to do these procedures every week, but I will tell you that we just en enrolled in a clinical trial that will allow us to fix a thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm completely endovascular. 
In close collaboration with our cardiac surgeons, we can do arch replacements. So this is the aorta as it comes out of the heart down here. And we can, if the aneurysm forms here, then we can do a complete arch replacement endovascular, or we can opt for a hybrid repair, where we do part of the procedure in an open fashion, and then we do, you can see the little silhouette here, we do the rest of it endovascularly. And we have a high volume of these complex cases here at Ohio State, so our outcomes are excellent. So I'm happy to declare, ladies and gentlemen, that we're well on our way to becoming a premier aortic center. I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow. Um, any, any questions? Can you put, can you show that one slide again? They're going to tell me. Can sure. you show that one slide again, the one where you said you were put on the earth can you to do this? Because yep. I want you to walk, maybe that. walk the audience through what were, what is actual from the human in the next slide. Yeah. And, and what did, and what did you do there? Because I think it's, it's so complicated. Yes. That it's worth Sure, I, I would love to talk about it. So um, we do these large surgeries in collaboration, so it's usually me and another cardiac surgeon working. The patient goes on partial heart bypass, so this is an incision basically from the back of your shoulder blade all the way around down to your pelvis, about 70 centimeters. Um, patient's on their side, so we go into the chest as well as the abdomen, and you can see here this is the lung, and we've got a cannula right here in the inferior pulmonary vein. So this allows us to uh, uh, pump blood flow from around and down into the legs because this is all clamped as I'm, as I'm working and replacing this, this is all clamped. So the patient gets blood flow to the legs while we're doing this 10 hour procedure. And then this is um, a Caselli graph, which means that this has already been sewn on there and we sort of um, plug each little bypass into the arteries that go to the liver, the intestines, the stomach, and the two kidneys. Now sometimes this configuration doesn't work and so I have to create it and so this is where the creativity comes in. So in this graft, uh, again the thoracic aorta is up here and I have a small bypass down here to the uh, arteries to the liver and then I have one that's coming from behind and coming all the way up and this is just because of real estate. It, was, it wasn't sitting very nicely. And then kidney arteries and then down to the lower extremities. Um, so like I said, sometimes it can take 10 hours. Um, you know, if everything goes well, we usually go about six to eight hours, and patients stay in the hospital for about 10 to 10 to 14 days. Wow. Other questions? So one of the areas that, that we're, we're very uh, interested in working on at the, at, the, at the Wexner Medical Center is how do we make it so she's not having to design these things and sew these things in real time? And so some of you have probably heard about these areas of things called 3D printers, and they can use them for in designing a part of a chair, but some of the things that we're working at at the medical center are designing these with biological tissues, so things that she could get a scan from a radiologist, and while she's working on the first part of the surgery, have that printed in real time, not shipped from Australia six to eight months out, to be able to do in, 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 in the same time. So a lot of this stuff is teamwork, and you, know, you and Dr. Sarak are really building a program to, to do yes. this. It's super exciting. So thank you again. Thank you.